Welcome to this presentation, the first of uh, the ones in this series, which will be covering chapter eight in our textbook. <coughs> the name of this chapter is the proper form of the contract, the writing. As we've covered in previous chapters, there are four elements to contracts. We need to have an agreement. We need to have consideration. We need to have legal capacity. We need to have legal object. Each one of those four requirements have, four, have, have a variety of number of, of sub-requirements, but those are the four things we have to have in, in order to have a contract. Many people think that there is a fifth thing that we have to have in order to have a contract, and that is a writing, something with a, a physical manifestation of the contract. Uh, there's an old saying, you perhaps have heard it, that an oral contract isn't worth a paper it's not written on. That's a popular belief, and as we've seen, it's not true under American law. Um, an oral contract is, in the vast majority of cases, completely enforceable. So when we talk about the writing aspect of a contract, we're not talking about it being an element of contract law. This isn't a fifth element. We just have our four. We have agreement. We need to have that. And then we have to have consideration. That's our second element. It's help, well, you don't have to list these in a particular order. It's helpful to list them in these orders simply to get in the habit of thinking about them this way. Um, there's nothing magical about this order. If you happen to think a different order is better, maybe you have a mnemonic to help you remember it, feel free to adopt a different order. This is the way that I always cover it, though. Um, legal capacity and legal object. As I said before, each one of these four elements have sub-elements. You notice on this list that I don't have offer and acceptance. When, um, I'm just going to say legality, legal, legal objects, another good way of saying it. Offer and acceptance are elements of agreement. They aren't elements of contract law. So they are elements of one of the elements of contract law. You may say, well, I mean, who cares? At the end of the day, you need to have offer and acceptance to have an agreement. You need to have an agreement to have a contract. So really, at the end of the day, you need to have an offer and acceptance to have a contract. Um, I agree with you. That is true. But sometimes in test questions, I require that you give me the elements of a contract. Um, if uh, you happen to give me all six, you say agreement, consideration, legal capacity, and legality, and you also include offer and acceptance, I probably am not going to mind, or at least I won't take off much. Um, but that's not usually what happens. Usually people who lift, list offer, offer and acceptance as one of the elements of contracts leaves off two of these others. So they might say offer and acceptance, consideration, and legal capacity. Well, they left this one off and they left this one off. So my suggestion is don't consider offer and acceptance elements of contracts because, you know, they aren't. They're elements of an agreement. It's a little bit like saying um, that we're making oxygen, excuse me, we're making water. We need hydrogen and oxygen to make the water. Um, and then we're making a recipe. Um, maybe we're making a, a cake and one of the ingredients we need is water. Well, guess what? You, you might technically say that an ingredient to our recipe for our cake is hydrogen and oxygen, but that's not really what you deal with, is it? What you really deal with is water, H2O, already combined. And so that would be a very misleading recipe if you were to list hydrogen and oxygen as ingredients to your cake recipe. So stick with these four elements and think about the elements that are sub-elements of these if you wish, and certainly that's helpful, but don't get confused between sub-elements and elements. And of course, writing is neither an element or a sub-element in the vast, vast majority of contracts. But there are a few contracts that do have a fifth element, and that fifth element is a writing. So sometimes people do list this fifth element, and they will put a little asterisk and they will say something like sometimes or occasionally. But because it's a sometimes situation, it isn't truly an element. It's a little bit like going back to my cake recipe. 
in order to have a cake, I don't need to put any cocoa in it. There's perfectly good cakes that have uh, carrots in it, that have vanilla in it, that have strawberry or lemon in it, that don't have any chocolate. I don't have to add cocoa to my recipe in order to make a cake. I need to have some type of cocoa in my cake in order to have a chocolate cake, but not any cake. So some cakes are going to require chocolate and some cakes aren't. But we wouldn't describe chocolate as an essential ingredient in a cake recipe. Similarly, we wouldn't say that a writing is an essential agreement to a contract. So let's go on from here. And we're gonna have three topics that we're gonna talk about in this chapter. And in this first lecture, we're just going to get to this first item. Uh, statute of frauds. Then in our second lecture we will, I expect, be able to get to both of the other two items which are interpretation rules of contracts and the parole evidence rule. Um, this first topic though is taking over, taking up a little bit over half of our chapter and um, is a uh, kind of its own thing. It's kind of separate issue so um, that's going to be what we're going to be focusing on during this lecture today. So statute of frauds. Um, in, in most, most of the semesters I've taught this course, there will be one to say five students who make a mistake about this. And so I'm telling you right now that most students get this right, but there's a significant minority who um, don't get this right. And I don't want you to be that student. And so that what happens is, is that we had that chapter in our textbook where we talked about reality of assent and mutuality of assent. And one of the things we talked about was the possibility of fraud. We talked about fraudulent misrepresentation, innocent misrepresentation, negligent misrepresentation. Hopefully these ideas are ringing a bell. Um, I believe that was maybe in chapter five. I'm not 100% sure of the chapter number, but it's something along those lines. And so what happens is people remember something about that lecture, and then they hear this name, statute of frauds, and they assume, not illogically, that this statute must have something to do with that reality of assent topic fraud. That makes perfect logical sense. I'm not going to try to argue that that reasoning that those students uh, go through is, is not reasonable, but it's just not right, not even close to right. And so don't be that student. Don't be fooled by the word frauds here. If I could rewrite this statute, I would take away the word fraud and I would replace it with the word writing, statute of writings. I might say statute of writings. I'll add an S to it. That's what I would do. But you know what? I am not the legislature in the state of Texas. And so I don't have the ability to do that. So I would change this name, but guess what? I, I, uh, the, the, what I would like to change about it, it doesn't have much meaning to you. Uh, in terms of your career. The uh, judges that you work with, opposing counsel that you work with, the attorneys and paralegals with, with whom you work are going to use the term statute of frauds. So let's talk about what statute of frauds is. Well, the first thing you notice about statute of frauds is the statute of frauds is a statute. So we're really not talking about the common law here. You know, in, in the vast, vast majority of this class, so at least to date, we've been talking about the common law. We haven't really looked at any statutes, or at least very few statutes at this point, very, very few of them. But this is a statute. This is not something that we turn to the common law. Some legislature somewhere has to have passed this law. If uh, the state of Texas legislature decided tomorrow to, tomorrow to get rid of the statute, we would have no statute of frauds. There is no common law version of this. So we have a statute of frauds. It's a statute that required, and I'm going to say requires because it's still the law, that requires certain classes of contract, I'm going to say contracts, to be in writing and signed by the parties. So the statute of frauds is about requiring some contracts to be in writing. Its purpose is to prevent fraud. Okay? So this was a strategy that the legislature, the parliament, in case of England, developed to avoid fraud. It doesn't have magical powers, though. Requiring that a contract be reduced to writing doesn't eliminate the chances of fraud, and in fact, in some respects, will even create 
additional opportunities for fraud. So the connection between this writing requirement and its goal of preventing fraud is not tremendously tight. I'm going to share some examples of, of what the, let, the Parliament was thinking, the, the uh, English Parliament was thinking at this time when it decided to start requiring that some contracts be in writing to, to let, let you know kind of what was going on in the society, what the concerns were, and how this strategy was supposed to address this issue. But what I want you to focus on is not so much the fraud aspect, but the fact that we have to have a writing sometimes. And the first half of this chapter, we're going to focus on, okay, well, what kind of writing do we need? What kind of things, what type of contracts, what classes of contracts require this writing? Um, so because it is a requirement for these classes of contracts, we do have that fifth element. We have, again, this the four that we always expect to see in a contract, agreement, consideration, legal capacity, and legal object. Those are certain things that we need in every contract. And now for this, these particular classes of contracts, which we'll go through the ones that are covered in a minute, we have a fifth requirement. There has to be a writing. So we have this requirement in all 50 states except for one, Louisiana. Um, you probably uh, are familiar with the fact that Louisiana has some important differences from the rest of our uh, states. Uh, certainly historically it has differences and legally it has major differences. We talked about this when we talked about the UCC and the fact that Louisiana is the only state that has very significant parts that you see that, that it has chosen not to adopt. And we talked about the fact that it is a civil code jurisdiction, meaning that its legal system developed from the Napoleonic Code because it was part of the Napoleon's empire, the French empire, um, at the time that it was purchased from uh, Napoleon in 1803 and became part of the United States. That historical wrinkle, the fact that it's not a common law jurisdiction for the most part, is also related to the fact that it doesn't have a statute of frauds. And as I said before, the statute of frauds is not common law, but it is something that has developed historically in Great Britain. It was designed to address a particular British problem and it addressed it in a particular British way. And as a result of our close connections or most states' close connections with Great Britain, uh, states said, well, gosh, this is the way the British solved this problem, and it seems to have worked okay for them, so that's how we're going to solve the problem. Now, each state could have said, no, we're a common law jurisdiction. We think the common law is super cool, and we want to continue it, but we don't think this law is super cool. We don't want to follow it, and they would have been perfectly within their rights to do so, um, but it just so happens that all the states that chose to be common law jurisdictions, uh, the, the attorneys and their particular jurisdictions grew up knowing about the statute of frauds and they all kind of thought this is a cool thing and we want to keep it. So while it isn't a requirement for common law jurisdictions to have a statute of frauds, it's worked out as a practical matter that they all do have it. But it's not surprising Louisiana wouldn't because after all it wasn't a common law jurisdiction. It doesn't have those historical ties with Great Britain. Its ties were to France and France didn't have a statute of frauds. So for that reason, Louisiana does not have a statute of frauds, but the other 49 states do. So I've kind of given a little bit of history, but I want to uh, present to you um, a, uh, a, an interesting contrast. I don't know what the rules are in Australia or Canada or South Africa or India. I don't know if those jurisdictions still have statutes of fraud or not, but I will tell you Great Britain no longer has a statute of frauds. It was a slow process. I don't know when it began, but I think the last time there was any part of the statute of frauds that was still in effect might have been in the 1980s, maybe even a little bit before then. Um, so they haven't had the statute of frauds in quite a while. They have chosen to get rid of it. And we'll talk about why they made that choice and um, uh, a little bit later uh, as, as we're going through this lecture. But it, it's interesting to, to see that while we have it, because of our historical ties with Great Britain, Great Britain itself has decided it doesn't need it or wouldn't benefit from having it. Okay, so let me give you some examples about the concerns that Parliament may have had. Imagine that I am a poor peasant person. 
Um, and we'll, we'll say I'm not super poor because I have some land. Maybe I've inherited the land. Maybe I have a, a very lengthy lease on this land. Uh, for all intents and purposes, this small part of parcel of land is mine. It's all that I have of value in the world. And the only thing that I know how to do to earn a living is to farm on this land. Life is hard for me. If my crops fail, my family is likely to go hungry. Um, uh, certainly, I um, am not well educated. I'm not going to be able to go into a different industry. Um, you know, there's lots of, of hazards that confront me in my life. If I somehow were to lose this land, most likely I would starve to death and my family would starve to death. So there's no real thought of, of me being separated from this land. That is not something that can possibly be good for me. So imagine as I'm tilling my small parcel of land, hoping to eke out a living for this next year, uh, three noblemen approach my little piece of land and they stop and they introduce themselves and they compliment me on my little part a pat parcel of land and they say one says to me we'll call him sir bob sir bob says to me um mr scroover um i understand you want to sell your land i am well, want, wanting to buy it from you and i say to sir bob sir bob what you flatter me by expressing an interest in my land, but no, I don't have an interest in selling my land, but, but thank you for your interest. And Sir Bob says, well, I really think that you ought to think about selling your land. I'm prepared to offer you a good price. And again, I say, Sir Bob, thank you. You do me great honor, but no, thank you. I need this land. This is the only way I can earn a living. And Sir Bob goes, oh, oh, I think I understand now. And then he, he raises his voice significantly higher than it was before and says, So, Mistress Groover, I hear that you accept my offer for me to buy your land for 10 pounds. And I look at him like he's crazy. Well, no, no, Sir Bob, th that's not what I said. I, I said that I, I don't want to sell you my land. Um, I don't want to sell it to you for any price, but 10 pounds would definitely not be enough. That might feed my family for a year, maybe even 18 months. But at the end of that time, we would starve. So I don't want to sell it at all, but I definitely don't want to sell it for 10 pounds. And Sir Bob goes, oh, you've made me very, very happy. I will um, drop off the, the 10 pounds to you tomorrow. And I would like for y'all to be off of my land now within 48 hours. And I say, but, but no, no, I'm not, I'm not going. It's not your land. It's my land. You can't do this. And Sir Bob goes, why, yes, I can do this, Mr. Scroover, because I am here with my two friends and they will both testify that you agreed to my terms. And so I will go to course to enforce this set contract that you've entered in, entered into with me. And I will be able to get the court to force you off the land um, in exchange for me giving you $10. And uh, that is how it will go. And I, and I will say, but, but I, I will fight you. And he goes, well, you certainly can. You can go to court with me. Of course, you aren't an attorney. You don't know any attorneys. You don't know how to read. Uh, there's no witnesses for your side other than your own testimony. I have two friends as witnesses. So it seems really unlikely that you would win, but certainly you can try to beat me in this endeavor. So you can see how the, the deck was stacked against somebody under those circumstances. Let me present to you another story. In this story, I am a, an heiress, a very wealthy woman. We'll say I am 22 years old and a little naive, but... Uh, uh, kind of out going to balls and uh, events like that pretty often. Anyway, I am at one of these balls and a young suitor approaches me and he goes, oh, Miss Groover, I would be honored if you would dance with me. And I say, oh, you know, he's very elegant, very nicely dressed, very charming. I say, of course, I would be honored to dance with you. So he whisks me off on the dance floor and we're twirling around and there's music playing and 
he sweeps me off onto the balcony and we're twirling around the balcony and it's oh so romantic anyway he pulls me over into a corner and he goes miss groover you would make me the happiest man in the world if you would but agree to marry me will you marry me and i say well no i mean i don't know you and you don't have any money and no i i, I won't marry you and he looks at me are you sure yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Thanks. Thank you very much, but no thank you. And then two of his friends jump up from behind the potted plant, and he says, Thank you, Miss Groover. You have made me the happiest and one of the richest men in the world. And he whisks me back onto the dance floor. He says at the end of the dance, uh, uh, Ladies and gentlemen at the party, Miss Groover has agreed to be my bride, and everybody claps. And I'm like, what just happened there? And I might start, but, 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 but there's no opportunity. Everybody is coming over to congratulate me. And um, even if I do protest, he has two witnesses who will say, yes, I heard her say yes. And under those circumstances, we have the four elements of contract. So I might be in a position in which I could be entering into a marriage contract that I don't at all want to get into. Let's consider a little bit different scenario kind of along those same lines. Uh, this time I am still a 22 year old, but I'm quite a bit more impressed with this young suitor than I was in my first scenario. I mean, this suitor is handsome and he's charming and he's a wonderful dancer. And when he sweeps me into his arms and twirls me around the dance floor, I'll be honest, I'm in a, in a fog of infatuation. He whisks me off onto the balcony and he says, and again, I've had a few glasses of champagne, which he's probably furnished to me. And he says to me, oh, Miss Groover, you would make me the happiest man in the world if you would but say yes. Will you say yes? And I say, yes. And he goes, yay, thank you. He, and he, he uh, swirls me out of the dance floor and he says that same thing. Uh, says the same thing. He says, ah, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Groover has agreed to be my bride. The next morning I wake up with a bit of a hangover and I think to myself, what did I do last night? Did I agree to marry that poor but really good looking loser? Is that what I want for my life? I don't think so. I was a little tipsy, a little drunk on infatuation. If I had but had a little bit more time to carefully consider my options, I never would have agreed to this. And yet, I have agreed. I received an offer. I accepted it. There was consideration, mutual agreements to marry. I was, uh, had my legal capacity. I was 22. And certainly, marriage is a lawful object. Gosh, I'm stuck. These are the three, these are three examples of situations that we once upon a time before the statute of frauds didn't require writing. And so you can see in these cases we have people who are either lied about, so, so uh, oral contracts create the opportunity for people to lie about whether in fact there was a contract to begin with. Um, they can say that an oral contract existed when in fact there never was an oral contract. It also though allows for the problem of somebody making an impulsive or unwise momentary decision that if they had thought about a little bit longer the time that it might take to reduce it to writing they might well have said oops this is not a good decision for me. So the statute of frauds really is kind of two purposes. One is to eliminate that fraud, the actual perjury, and the second is to maybe make people pause for a second before they enter into the contract. The, the writing does create that, that moment for a little bit of reflection. So those are the reasons that we have the statute of frauds. But keep in mind, our primary emphasis isn't on the fraud part, it's on the writing part. Because the statute of frauds writing requirement applies even if there's no fraud at all.
we have to have a writing. The policy reason behind this requirement is really not of, of a great deal of importance. It, it can, knowing this part can help you make sense of why we call the statute the name we do. But focusing on this part and not emphasizing this is going to result in you getting confused about it. So keep in mind the statute of frauds is really about writings, the requirement that we have writings. There are um, five traditional requirements for statute of frauds. We'll talk about two additional ones as we get closer to the end. So I'm going to put two little asterisks here. So we really have, in some sense, seven requirements or seven situations where we, where we need to have a writing in the state of Texas. The first one is we need to have a writing when a contract by its own terms cannot be performed with one year of its making. So contracts that are going to last more than a year need to be in writing. That's the first requirement. The second requirement is a contract to answer for another's debt also needs to be in writing. A classic example of this is when one person co-signs for the, the loan of another person. For example, if I'm, um, if my friend Bob is buying a car, his credit isn't so good, he might want me to co-sign for him so that the bank will approve his loan. That co-signing arrangement, my agreement to, to assume his debt if Bob doesn't pay, would be the, a contract to answer for another's debt. That's another type of contract that has to be in writing. A third is when an executor, or it could be an executrix, or an administrator, an administratrix, promises to pay the, the debts of an estate. An executor, of course, is somebody who's a, who is settling the estate of a decedent of a dead person. Uh, sometimes people who die owed more money than their assets were, were worth. And sometimes an executor might morally feel like, gosh, maybe I ought to settle the debts of this estate in my role as executor. Of course, he doesn't have a legal requirement to do so, but sometimes the, 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 the executor may feel a moral or, or emotional motivation to do so. And an agreement that he or she might make under those situations, that has to be in writing. A fourth situation is a contract in consideration of marriage. As we already talked about, um, a, 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 an agreement to marry. Again, traditionally, these were uh, situations that involved marriage settlements with dowries and things like that. Obviously, we don't really have those in modern day America, but we do have prenuptial agreements. Uh, agreements uh, that couples enter into before they marry that discuss how their assets will be divided. Um, in the event of a divorce or the death of one of the parties. Those need to be in writing. And finally, we have a contract involving real property. This is land. Uh, so it could be to buy land. It could be to rent land. It could be for a mortgage on land. It could be for an interest relating to land, such as a mineral interest or something like that. We'll talk about the last two at the end of this section. So I'm going to say, get a little excitement, a little anticipation going for these last two. Now don't, let me just tell you now, don't look ahead. I want it to be a surprise when we get to the last two. It's kind of like, you know, turning to the last page of the murder mystery book. You don't want to do that, okay? So anyway, let's, let's go here. Here is the statute that we have. I'm just going to actually pull up the statute. So we're going to look in the, in the Texas Business and Commerce Code. 2601. So let's just pull this down here. And I am going to, oops. So to find Texas statutes, you just have to type in literally Texas statutes. It'll be the first one that pulls up here. You go into that and you'll go into Actually, the right screen goes up. We're going to go into the Texas Business and Commerce Code. And then we're going to go down here. We're looking for 26. Here we go. Scroll down here, and you can see it actually says Statute of Frauds. You can see that um, this is what we want, 2601. Promise or agreement must be in writing. So let's look at that. So this is the entire Statute of Frauds. This is what we're talking about today. 
Um, it's not very long, and this is really all the specificity we have in the statute. So I'm going to show you the statute maybe in a little bit prettier format, but it's word for word what's on this slide. So let's go back to our uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so promise or agreement must be in writing. And we have our first section. Not surprisingly, it's section A says, a promise or agreement described in subsection B. So we haven't gotten to B yet. We'll get to B in a second. So we're, so we're talking about what this next section talks about is not enforceable unless the promise or agreement or a memorandum of it is in writing and signed by the person to be charged with the promise or agreement or by someone lawfully authorized to sign for him. So whatever categories are covered in section B that, that, that state, hey, you need to have a writing, this is what we mean when we want a writing. It has to be in writing and it has to be signed by the person who's being sued. So let's say I'm suing Bob to enforce a contract. Bob is the defendant, I'm the plaintiff. The fact that I signed the paper isn't legally relevant. What's important is that did Bob sign the paper? Because he's the one being charged with the promise. I'm suing him, I'm trying to enforce the promise against him. So we're looking really at the defendant from this perspective. So this is the first section, section A, but let's find out what's in the subsection B. Here we go. Subsection of this section apply, or B, subsection A of this section applies to, and here we have, you can actually see we have eight categories here. So they, but prior we, we saw over here, we had five categories and I said that we're adding two extras. I said I was going to save one, the, the two until the very end. Well, actually, I'm going to let you see this, this first one right here a little earlier. Okay, um, the Texas statutes divided up a bit differently than the way our textbook does. So we actually have eight here, although in the textbook there's only seven, but we'll see that really it's the same subject. It's just a different way of dividing it. So our first one is a promise by an executor or administrator to answer out of his own debt for his own estate for any debt or damage due from his testator or intestate. This is the person who died whose wills he's administering. So you can see this is just here, right? So this is number one from the Texas statute. A promise by one person to answer for the debt, default, or miscarriage of another person. This is that co-signing situation. So let's find that right here. Number three is an agreement made in consideration of marriage or on consideration of non-maritable conjugal cohabitation. Number three. We have number four, a contract for the sale of real estate. Number four. Now we have number five, a lease of real estate for a term longer than one year. That's number five, I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted there. You could put that under either this one or this one. I'm gonna put it under both. Number six, an agreement which is not to be performed within one year from the date of making the agreement. Okay, that's number six. So we're gonna put that right up here, number six. Number seven, a promise or agreement to pay a commission for the sale or purchase of an oil or gas mining lease, an oil or gas royalty, minerals, or mineral interest. This is real estate. This is all about stuff under the land. So number seven, got it right here. And then number eight is our funky one. So an agreement, promise, or contract, or warranty of cure relating to medical care or results that are made by a physician or healthcare provider as defined by this particular part of the law, this section does not apply to pharmacists. So that's number eight. We'll talk more about that at the end.
So you can see all of our categories under our Texas statute uh, correlate to the ones that we already have and we've just added another one. So now we're going to go through each one of these, but we're not going to use the order in our statute. We're going to use the order in the textbook. We're going to stick with this order. Just wanted to show you before we went into it that the same things we're talking about um, in the organization of the textbook relate to how we, we look at this also under Texas state law. So let's look at that first item. And the first item again is a contract that by its terms cannot be performed within one year of its making. And again, I've just taken the Texas statute. You can see it's word for word, an agreement which is not to be performed with one year from the date of making the agreement. So I just literally cut and pasted this language right here. So um, the way that the courts approach this is, is the courts tend to um, want to find that the statute of frauds doesn't apply. Their, their assumption is if there's a way for us to look at this and say, you know what, the statute of frauds doesn't apply, then that's going to be kind of their default status here. So when you read this language, you might say, well, there could be some contracts that you're just not sure whether they're going to be completed within a year or not. I mean, if there's, for example, let's say I'm building, uh, well, let's, let's imagine, let me scroll ahead, I'll show you this, this house, Dion Sanders' house. You, if you, this is, um, he didn't, no longer lives there, but this is in uh, Salina. If you go north on Preston Road in Salina, before you hit the new Salina High School, you'll see, if you're going north, you'll see on the right side of the road, this fancy, brand new, beautiful Kroger. Well, just north of it, I mean, literally just north of it, there is this palace, this huge, huge house uh, that was once owned by Deion Sanders. And so literally, I mean, right here is the parking lot for the uh, Kroger. Um, anyway, this house, imagine, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's ridiculously big. Uh, multiple, you know, I don't know, a dozen bedrooms, uh, more than one kitchen. I mean, just tons of stuff. You know, I don't know how many tens of thousands of square feet, but just really, really large house. So let's imagine that Deion Sanders approached you back when he was trying to build this house. And he goes, listen, uh, we'll say he approached Bob. Listen, Bob, I, you're a great general contractor. You've done some work on the past. I want you to build this house for me. Um, I've had the architect draw up the plans. Um, I want you to be the general contractor, hire all the subs, get everything organized to build this house. And so we sit down, we crunch some numbers, I give them a number, we negotiate back and forth, and we reach an agreement. And I go, okay, well, I'll write up the contract. And Dion says, you know what, I'm, a, I'm an honorable man, I think you're an honorable man, let's just shake on it. I, I, I feel like that's the way I like to do business, that's how I want to do business with you. Bob's like, okay, I, I guess we can just shake on it, because I really want your business, so okay. So they shake on it. Um, Bob goes out and he starts hiring the subcontractors, making all the arrangements. Um, when Bob and Dion discussed it, um, Bob said, listen, Dion, if everything goes perfectly, and it never does, but imagine everything falls into place perfectly, we can get this house done in 11 months. But realistically, it's probably going to be 18 months. I mean, when I say perfectly, I mean there's no uh, delays due to rain. There's no problems getting the city inspectors out. There's no back order of um, equipment or supplies or fixtures. Um, nothing, there's no time where the workers um, uh, are unavailable or um, that work has to be redone because somebody painted a wall the wrong color. Um, you know, if everything goes perfectly, 11 months. More realistically, 18 months. Um, and, the, and so the understands that they, they go about making the, the house, they build it, and they get it done in 14 months. Um, Bob's quite proud of the work that he's done. Uh, he feels like the house turned out really, really nicely. Um, 
Bob and Dion are walking through the house, but even though it looks great, I mean, it's not perfect. You can't have that many various people working on a project like this without seeing a couple of errors here and there. Dion looks at it and he goes, ah, this is awful. This is not the house I wanted. I see this minor problem. Of course, he doesn't think it's a minor problem. I see this problem. I see that problem. I just am not willing to pay for this piece of garbage. I am not going to pay you any money for this project. Bob ends up having to sue Dion over it. And Dion says, well, where's our contract? I don't see anything signed. I don't see any paper version. And Bob says, well, you know, um, uh, you know, we, 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 we shook on it. We had an agreement. Um, well, the, the courts would say under those circumstances, well, Bob, you said it was possible for the contract to be completed within 11 months. So this provision does not apply. Your contract doesn't have to be in writing for this reason because it would, would have been possible. So this doesn't apply to the facts in your case and it doesn't need to be in writing for this reason. The question is, is it possible for the contract to occur within a year? It's the, the relevant question isn't, did it actually take longer than a year? That's not the question. The question is, if everything had worked out just so, would have been accomplished in within 365 days or 366 days, I guess, in a leap year. Um, let's consider uh, a, a contract that would require a writing. Let's say that a Dion, after, let's say Dion is happy with the house after it's been built. And uh, he goes to Bob and goes, listen, Bob, I understand you also own a janitorial service. Um, I would like to hire your janitorial service to come out once a week and to clean my house. Um, and I'd like to enter into this contract with, with you for 13 months. Bob and, and Dion agree to it again. It's a handshake deal. Uh, there's a dispute at some point. Somebody sues somebody else. And again, the issue is, well, could the contract, is it possible to perform under this contract within one year? Well, you can't pre-clean a house and you can't clean dirt that isn't there yet. And so a contract for janitorial services for 13 months could not possibly be performed within one year. So that would be an example of a contract in which this provision definitely does apply. And it would be a requirement that it be reduced into writing according to these terms here that we'll talk about in more detail later. Let's consider a, a scenario that's a little bit surprising. Let's imagine that after Bob builds this palace for Dion, Dion is so delighted with it, he says to Bob, listen, Bob, I have a large company here that I'm the CEO of. You have just done such a great job. I want to hire you. And you know what? I, um, I know that you're running your own successful business. I appreciate that. I know that you're giving up a lot of autonomy and security with this business that you have. And so I want to guarantee you lifetime employment with me. You'll have a job here for the rest of your life if you choose to stay. Bob thinks, well, Dion's great to work with. He's very successful, smart man. Yeah, okay. They negotiate over the benefits and pay, but they work it all out and Bob uh, sells his business and goes to work for Dion. And he worked for Dion for several months. But you know what? Dion and Bob have a falling out. Bob uh, has one vision for how the business ought to go and Dion has another. And Dion one day becomes so frustrated with Bob, he says, Bob, get out of here. I'm done with you. I don't want to see you. I don't want to work with you anymore. In other words, Dion fires Bob. Well, Bob says, but what about my lifetime contract? Dion says, what lifetime contract? And Bob says, remember when you were uh, interviewing me for that opening, you, you offered me a job and you said I would have it for the rest of my life? Um, well, Dion says, well, you're going to live more than a year, right? Isn't that whole statute of frauds, doesn't that require um, that an agreement which is not to be performed within one year from the date of making the agreement has to be in writing? Well, we never did reduce it into writing, and so therefore that uh, requirement uh, means that, that 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 contract is null and void. Well, unfortunately for Dion, and I guess also unfortunately for Bob, such a contract is potentially uh, 
valid. There are other reasons why it's probably not enforceable in Texas that are beyond the scope of this, this particular um, chapter, but the statute of frauds isn't why it's not enforceable. Because Bob could have been hit by a train or a bus or have a heart attack or any number of bad things happened to him right after he had entered into this agreement with Dion. It is possible that the lifetime contract could have been performed within one year if Bob dies quickly, right? And so because a relevant lifetime can be less than 365 days, the, 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 it is possible for the contract to be completely performed within one year. So a lifetime contract doesn't fit under the categories of the statute of frauds, even if the person entering the contract is a, uh, an 18-year-old. Even if statistically it's very unlikely that he'll die within the next 365 days. Now this interpretation, the is it possible rule, is not the rule in every single jurisdiction, but it is the rule in Texas, so it's the rule that I'm going to expect you to be familiar with. So that's our, uh, let's just pause here and a little history. This happens to be uh, Versailles. Versailles, of course, is a palace in France, a uh, very fancy palace. It was actually um, uh, the, where the, uh, the king and queen of France lived. It's where the political power in France existed um, at various points of time in French history. But uh, perhaps the most important period of time where the palace at Versailles was important was during uh, Louis XIV's reign. And he established this as a center of his uh, political power in 1682. 1682. Um, it actually wasn't finished as a palace until sometime after that, but the, the important year, the, the kind of the, the beginning time of it becoming a really important place in France was 1682. Let's move on from here. You can see this palace, obviously the, uh, the um, uh, Statue of Frauds wouldn't have applied in France, but if this palace had been uh, being built and the Statue of Frauds had applied, you can see that this, there's no way this could have been completed in a year, and it took uh, many, many years for it to be completed. And so I think that, that under those circumstances, if the Statue of Frauds had been in effect in Texas, I'm assuming in France at that time, then this would have been required to have been in writing. So we have completed our first um, category for the statute of frauds. We've covered the fact that a contract that cannot be performed within one year of its making has to be in writing. Let's move on to our second category, which is a contract to answer for another's debt. And again, the, the classic term for this is co-signing, and this is the language we have from the Texas statute. A promise by one person to answer for the debt, default, or miscarriage of another person. So we have um, that, that this third party is this person right here, the person who's making the promise. He or she is acting as a guarantor or a surety. And we have these two terms defined here from the textbook. So what is a surety? A person who promises to pay the debt or to satisfy the obligation of another person. And this other person we call the principal. And a guarantor is the person who makes or gives a guarantee. So you can see in this situation, both of these terms point to this third party here. The obligor is a person who owes an obligation to another, a promisor. So the obligor is this other person, also the principal. Let me just kind of this scenario can help maybe figure out this, this meaning. The meaning here isn't hard. I think the challenge with this is keeping the vocabulary term straight. So let's look at a kind of a classic example of how this might play out. So we have B. B is the bank, the person who is loaning the money. C is, um, we'll call him Carl. C is the person who, um, uh, wants to borrow the money. So he is, Carl is going to promise the bank that he's going to repay the money with interest and the bank is going to agree to loan Carl this money. Now you can see how we have consideration. He's making the promise to repay, so that's Carl's consideration. The bank's consideration is the money that he's give, not giving to Carl, but agreeing to loan to Carl. 
both Carl and the bank have legal capacity. There's nothing unlawful about this contract. There's offer and acceptance. I mean, we have a complete contract here. This contract doesn't have to be in writing. Nothing, I mean, the bank is going to insist that it be in writing. I mean, that's a good business practice. But from a purely legal standpoint, no, it doesn't have to be in writing at all. But as a practical matter, it's going to be in writing. But you know, the problem with this transaction is, bless Carl's poor little heart, he isn't the best credit risk. He's had some ups and downs in his life. Maybe he's had difficulty maintaining employment. Maybe he lives a little too richly and sometimes doesn't pay his bills on time. Who knows what Carl's story is, but whatever it is, the bank says, uh-uh, Bob, uh-uh, uh, Carl, and we're not agreeing to loan you this money because your credit rating stinks. So Carl then goes to his Aunt a Angela. Aunt Angela, he said, hey, Aunt Angela, my dear, my favorite aunt, I um, would really, 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 really appreciate if you would co-sign for my, my loan. I need this money so that I can uh, get a car so that I can work again. Without a car, I can't get to, I can't interview for, for jobs. I can't go to places uh, to work. Um, I need to have this car so I can get back on my feet. Please, Aunt Angela, help me out. So Aunt Angela, because she, she loves her nephew Carl very much, agrees to co-sign for the loan. The bank now is willing to enter into the contract with Carl because it knows that even if Carl stops paying, it can then go to Angela, and Angela has a good credit rating, and say, Angela, now you must pay us. So this is the second contract. This contract here is the one that has to be in writing. This is the one that the statute of frauds requires the writing. You can see that it's kind of an unusual contract because there's only, Angela's receiving consideration, or is not receiving any consideration. Now it is true that it's not necessary that the bank give consideration to Angela. The, the consideration that the bank is giving to Carl counts as consideration uh, for this second contract as well um, but it's it's Angela herself is not benefiting from this loan of money to Carl I mean she's not getting the money um, she's just getting this obligation and so th so the, the courts do or excuse me not the courts the, the law does require this be in writing and the logic here is that uh, you know what Angela's being a nice person and it's lovely that Angela wants to be a nice person. And certainly the law wants to encourage people to be nice to each other. But the law also recognizes that sometimes bozos like Carl kind of twist people's arms a little bit, puts them, put them in maybe socially awkward positions and catches Angela at a weak moment and persuades her to enter into a deal that's honestly not in her best interest. And so she flippantly says yes, maybe without really thinking it through, maybe without talking it over with her spouse. And gosh, two minutes later, she regrets the decision. But hey, if we didn't have a writing requirement, she would be contractually bound. The writing requirement is just giving her the opportunity to be a little cautious, to kind of think things through a little bit more carefully. She can still agree to it. Um, once she's had time to think about it and before she puts her signature on the writing. Um, and of course, if she does sign it, then she is bound, but it's just an opportunity to give her just a moment to reflect upon it in a little bit more care. So let's see who these players are. So A, well actually let's start with B, the bank. B is the promisee or the offeree. Um, he is, the, the bank, I guess it, is receiving a promise from Carl the primary promise, promise to pay, and also a promise from Angela, a secondary promise to pay. Whomever is receiving a promise, we call the promisee. We could also say, I don't know why I have an extra, there's there, that they are the offeree. Now we don't know for sure who made this initial offer. It could be that the bank is the offeror, and C and Carl and Angela are the offeree. But they could be. But it could be that Carl made this offer. And then, of course, if Carl made the offer, then the, then the bank is the offeree. Now let's consider Carl. Carl is the promisor, and he's promising to pay. Or in this is Sarah, if, if the bank is a promisee and the offeree, then Carl is the offeror. 
Carl is the debtor. He's the one receiving the loan, the money. And then Angela here is the guarantor or the surety. And we have the definition of these terms back here. This is the backup promiser. Of course, Angela pays only if Carl does not meet Carl's obligations. So the bank goes to Carl first and only goes to Angela if Carl doesn't pay up. So this contract right here has to be in writing to satisfy the statute of frauds. Having said that, there is a situation in which this type of contract doesn't have to be in writing. Let's go to the next slide to talk about that. This rule has two names. Um, you are responsible for both. One is, a, sometimes it's called the leading object rule, the other is the main purpose rule. I think, I'm not sure which term I use more often. I probably use the leading object term more often, but both are perfectly legitimate terms. You'll hear both of them pretty regularly. So let's talk about this. This is the same situation that we've talked about before. Literally, we have the exact same uh, terms, the exact same relationships. This whole scheme is exactly the same scenario. Um, the only difference doesn't show up in this picture. Because remember, in this story, we had Angela doing this out of the goodness of the, her heart for her deadbeat nephew, Carl. She was getting nothing out of this other than being a good aunt. But sometimes that's not the way things go. Sometimes the person who um, is in this role, sometimes the person who is A, is actually agreeing to co-sign, not because A is just a tremendously generous person, but because A is getting something out of this. Let's see what I'm, well, let me give a little example here, a little definition here. What is the leading object rule? It's the rule that a contract to guarantee the debt of another must be in writing does not apply. So the statute of frauds does not apply if the promisor's leading object, in other words, A's leading object, or main purpose in giving the guarantee is to benefit himself or herself. So if A is doing this out of self-interest, statute of frauds doesn't apply. Let me give an example. Um, imagine for a second that um, you are, Mick Jagger. Here is Mick Jagger on the back in the back of a limousine. Mick Jagger probably doesn't drive his car that often. He is usually being driven around town so he can avoid the crowds and the paparazzi and things like that. Anyway, when he's in London, he has a favorite limousine driver. We're going to call his favorite limousine driver Bob. And Bob knows all of the cool haunts that Mick likes to go to. Bob knows how to avoid the paparazzi. He knows how to get from one place in London to another as quickly as possible, getting the fewest number of tickets, all that good stuff. Plus, Bob's fun. Nick, Mick likes hanging around. By the way, this is Mick's name here. Mick, M-I-C-K, Jagger. Um, yeah, Bob's fun to hang around with. Uh, Mick enjoys Bob's company, and they've developed a rapport over the years. Bob's not a wealthy person. He works for, we'll say, A-plus limousine service. Um, but Bob has been saving up his money over the years, and he has a pretty nice nest egg. And what he'd really like to do is start his own business and um, buy just the perfect kind of limousine for this kind of uh, rock star clientele that he has established over the years. And so he goes to me, he goes, hey, Mick, you know, I'm going to uh, buy a, a limousine that's exactly what you want. I mean, I've, I've driven you around town and you've told me over the years you really like it to have this feature, but you don't want it to have this feature. And you know what? I have taken all those pieces of, of information together and I've come up with, I think, the perfect limousine design. Let me show it to you. And so uh, Bob shows Mick this perfect limousine design, and Mick loves it. Maybe he makes a few uh, corrections, but overall he thinks it's a great plan. So Bob then goes to the limousine manufacturer and says, listen, what is it going to cost for you to make this limousine a reality? It gets priced out. I'm going to say, I have no idea what a limousine costs. We'll say $300,000. Well, Bob doesn't have enough money for that. Um, he can't get a loan for that sum of money. 
So he goes to Mick and he says, hey, Mick, you know, I, I would love to be able to design this perfect limousine for you. You come to London all the time. You use me whenever you come here. And this limousine would be perfect for your needs. Plus, you'd have me to drive you around. And I know that you appreciate how I'm able to get you from one place to another. So in this scenario, instead of us having Bob, we have, instead of we have his Carl, we have Bob here. And we have Mick, the rock star. We'll just call it Mick Jagger here. And then this is still the bank. So um, Bob is promising to pay the bank back. The bank wants to loan Bob money, but the bank says, Bob, you're not a good credit risk. Bob goes, well, what about if Mick Jagger signs with me? bank looks over mixed financials well yeah that's no problem he can afford tons of limos for how much money he has and so mix signs guarantees the loan acts as a co-signer mix not doing it to be nice to bob he's doing it because he is considering his own comfort he wants to be in that awesome limo that that bob is designing he wants to have bob as his driver his quality of life is going to be improved so the fact that, that Mick is signing as a co-signer for his own self-interest means that statute of frauds doesn't apply to this contract. Here's another example. A, promise, so this is Mick again, the, the Mick Jagger character, the Aunt Angela character, Pro, promise to be Carl's guarantee, or maybe it's Bob's, so that Carl could get money from the bank so that Carl could buy the equipment to complete Carl's contractual obligations to A. You can see in this situation, A is helping C do what C has to do to benefit A. So A is simply acting in A's own best self-interest. But again, if A promised to be C's guarantee because A is C's grandfather or best friend or aunt, that's a scenario it has to be in writing once out of the goodness of your heart. That's um, when the leading object rule doesn't apply and you do need to have it in writing. So we've covered the second uh, situation where the statute of fraud applies, when the contract is to answer for another's debt. Now we're going to talk about our third category, an executor's promise to pay estate debts. Okay, so here we have a, a fair amount of vocabulary. Let's just approach the vocabulary first, and then we'll go back and look at this. Uh, as we've talked about in previous lectures, sometimes our textbook likes to introduce kind of related vocabulary, but that isn't completely necessary. Um, I'm just going with it. It's in the textbook, so I'm going to ask that you know it. I agree with you that it is of limited applicability to contract law, but these are terms that a paralegal needs to know anyway. And if you don't end up taking wills, you will miss out on the stuff. So anyway, here's a little bit of free legal knowledge for you to have, but it's not completely free because you do need to know from the test. So probate. Probate is the process by which a will is found to be valid. So if you say you were probating in a, a will, that's that process. Um, the executor is the person who has been designated by the testator. This is the person who's dead, the decedent. But this applies in a situation where the person has written a will. So the person, so the decedent, obviously while the decedent is still alive, writes a will, and in his will he names somebody as the executor. So the person designated in the will to carry out the directions and requests in the testator's will and to dispose of the testator's property according to the provisions of his or her will. So the executor basically does what the will says. An administrator is very similar to an executor, but we have this in a situation where the decedent didn't write a will. So there is no document that the court can look to and say, okay, oh, I know who I should appoint. Ah, oh, there's nothing in the document that says. So this person is appointed by the court. Um, it's usually a, a child or a spouse or somebody else closely affiliated with that. Another time that you might have an administrator is when the person named in the will, the executor, in other words, decides, eh, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I was named in it, but I changed my mind, or maybe I never agreed. And so then the court has to appoint somebody. So obviously this is the preferred route, but if either the, the, there is no one named or the person who's named declines, then the court's going to appoint an administrator. Now we can see here the word decedent 
it looks like it begins like the word deceased. And that, of course, is the person who's died. We're caring about his or her will. Okay. So um, let's look at the language that we have in the Texas statute about this. Our language is uh, a promise by an executor or administrator. So it's not just executor, but it also includes that administrator category to answer out of his or her own estate for any debt or damage due from his testator or intestate. Okay, so let's go through a scenario that this might arise. Um, uh, we'll say that um, Bill Gates has a great aunt Mabel. Um, great aunt Mabel, you know, she's doing okay in life. She has a nice little nest egg, but she's no gazillionaire like her great nephew Bill Gates um, and uh, she names Bill Gates to be her uh, a executor in the will. Maybe Bill agrees, maybe he doesn't know, but however that plays out, that's what happens. Um, in the last couple of years of Mabel's life, she encounters some health issues and honestly, they drain out her savings. So she goes from having a nice little nest egg to actually being in significant debt. When she passes away, she owes more money than she has in net worth. Um, Bill is always very fond of his great aunt. Um, and uh, of course, he attends the funeral with all of his cousins and aunts and uncles, etc. And, you know, great aunt Mabel was a lovely woman, loved by everybody. And everybody is just so sad that she has passed away. And people's feelings get moved. They go to this funeral, you think about your own mortality, you think about all the lovely things about this special person. Maybe you're at the wake, or maybe you gathered at the, the family house after the dinner, and I mean after the funeral and are having lunch. And everybody is, is emotional and a little overwrought. Anyway, a few cousins approach Bill and say, oh Bill, I can't believe it, Mabel is gone. And Bill commiserates with them. And then they go, you know, Aunt Mabel, she always said to me that she wanted me to have her china. Oh, it's just so important to me that I get to, to have her china. I mean, it has so much emotion associated with it. I, I would come to her house every Sunday after church for, for dinner, and we would eat on that china. And the idea of it going to somebody else is just devastating. And, and I know that it's in her will. I know that it says in the will that uh, she is leaving me her china. And then another cousin comes up to Bill and says, hey, Bill, I don't know if you know this about Great Aunt Mabel, but she collected Beanie Babies. Uh, she has a very large collection, and she and I actually did it together. We would uh, compare notes, and she would buy this one, and I would buy the other, which we were careful not to, to buy the same one. So we would have, you know, as large a collection as possible. And she always told me that when she passed away, she would leave me those very, very precious, precious Beanie Babies. And I just, I just wouldn't be able to go on if, if I didn't get those Beanie Babies. Bill, I, I know it's in the will. Just, just make sure it happens. And Bill says to both of these cousins, of course, you can count on me. Of course, you're going to get Grand Aunt Mabel's China. And of course, you'll get all of the Beanie Babies. And he doesn't really think too much of it. He thinks that's what he's going to do. Why not? I mean, he's Bill Gates. This is not real money to him. So anyway, he a um, few days later, he's visiting an attorney trying to square away the estate. And he finds that, oh, he had assumed that Granite Mabel is doing okay financially. But he sees that, no, she really wasn't doing okay. <laughs> uh, she actually owed a few hundred thousand dollars. And um, he looks at all the particular bequests in the will, and he sees there's a lot of people that Grand Aunt Mabel thought she could leave stuff to. And all of these things ought to be liquidated and sold at auction or, or an estate sale so that um, uh, the, the, the creditors can be paid because they're, of course, entitled to the money first. And um, 
but Bill thinks back to those promises that he made kind of lightheartedly, unexpectedly at the funeral. And now he kind of regrets it. I mean, you know, times are tough. He's got kids in college. He's got, you know, that plumbing problem in his fifth house. That God's, you know, all the, the common problems that you and I face every day, right? He's got those issues too. And so he's not sure that he really wants to, to pay all of great Aunt Mabel's debts. But because he said he would, because he made that oral statement, Without the statement of statute of frauds, he might be required to make that good. And that's why we do require that it be in writing because the executor administrator can be put in kind of an emotionally difficult place to, to um, not settle. In fact, sometimes people actually choose an executor who is wealthy in the hopes that they would be willing to do this. Of course, in a normal probate proceeding, all the debts are paid estate debts are only paid from the estate's assets. Um, otherwise, most people would say, hey, I'm not going to agree to be an executor. I, I'm, it's a lot of hard work, thankless work. I, I definitely don't want to end up paying for that privilege. Um, but again, sometimes this moral duty feeling can arise, especially when there's a family member relationship there. And this, this requirement means that in order for that executor to be legally bound to a settle to get to settle the debts of the estate out of his or her own wealth that will only be a requirement if he or she signs a written document so we've covered our first three requirements that a contract um, that can't be performed within one year must be in writing a co-signing contract must be in writing, and the executor's agreement to pay for the estate debts must be in writing. And now we're ready for a contract in consideration of marriage. And here is the language we have in the Texas statute. An agreement made on consideration of marriage or on consideration of non-marital conjugal cohabitation. These pictures, by the way, are pictures of traditional um, uh, 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 kind of religiously based marriage contracts and uh, many people of the Jewish faith will enter into a marriage contract and uh, not in the sense of an arranged marriage although that probably happens in some parts of, of the Jewish community but um, uh, as a, a, a recognition that marriage is a contract and we certainly have that idea more largely in the secular or the Christian culture as well. We also see marriage contracts in other communities. It's not just restricted to the Jewish community. Of course, in, in, the, uh, in Euro the European world, um, marriage contracts or settlement, marriage settlement contracts were quite common, especially amongst the wealthy, even well until the 1800s. And so um, it's not something that is just restricted to uh, religious uh, issues. We see here uh, some contracts here in this particular picture. Um, the, the, this is a, 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 a painting in which um, a future husband and wife are signing the marriage settlement amounts. And we can see in this picture this bride is showing up at a wedding with her dowry, her settlement, in tow. <laughs> How romantic is that, right? Okay. So this type of contract is different from a simple promise to marry. So we're not talking about the scenario wherein people are just saying, I want to marry you, I want to marry you. No, we're talking about a situation in which there's an agreement that certain assets are going to be exchanged. Um, it must be coupled with an interest, a promise to exchange money or property as consideration for the marriage. Uh, this, more importantly for our purposes, this is kind of the historical stuff historical context but uh, nowadays this is the one the pre prenuptial agreement or premarital agreement is what is of interest to us nowadays that's how this becomes an issue if you had a, a premarital agreement um, that was just oral it's not going to be enforceable in Texas because the statute of frauds so let's consider a couple of, of vocabulary terms again we don't really think about dowry uh, nowadays, it's kind of an historical term you may have seen in, in, uh, in history books um, or things like that, but this is, um, the, the, the dowry is a property that a woman brings to her husband when she marries. 
This is kind of the assets that she's bringing into the relationship. Let's consider the term anti-nuptial agreement. When we see this term, the anti here does not mean anti as against, but anti meaning before, so before marriage, before the wedding. And so anti-nuptial means the same thing as premarital or prenuptial agreements. We usually use the word premarital in Texas. So what is this? It's a written contract, and it has to be in writing because the statute of frauds executed prior to the marriage, which divides up the party's real and personal property in the event that the marriage ends. And of course, all marriages end. They may end when, with the death of one of the parties, or, uh, but whether it's by divorce or um, death. Um, and there can be a, a variety of different circumstances in which they end with a variety of different division systems in place. Generally speaking, uh, premarital agreements are enforceable in Texas, again, if they're in writing and if other statutory requirements are satisfied. So those are our first four. Let's look at our last one. This is the most important by far, these categories. I mean, this one's a pretty important one, too. Um, but this one is, is the rock star of this gathering. Um, I'll share a little story about uh, my own family. When I was 30 years old, I was single, and um, I decided to buy a house. And shortly after I bought the house, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather was born in 1913, and my grandmother was born in 1919. Anyway, they came up to visit. And uh, they looked at the house and they thought it was a very nice house. It wasn't anything fancy, obviously, but it was a very nice house in their estimation. And my, my grandfather is, was born deaf. And so when he would uh, talk with people, sometimes he would speak louder than uh, he meant to because he couldn't hear. And so he pulled aside my grandmother to uh, metaphorically whisper in her ear, but he was talking so loudly that I could hear him. Anyway, he said to her, oh, uh, where's this fed? Oh, I'm so glad that uh, Cindy has bought this house. Maybe she'll finally be able to get a husband. <laughs> um, it didn't work out quite. They didn't get married for a little while longer. Uh, but uh, his, his idea was one that would have been a kind of a common one, uh, given the fact that you know, he grew up in, in the early 1900s in an uh, agrarian culture which of course is most of world history. Uh, most people live in those circumstances. Land was everything in his mind. Anytime he got a little bit extra money, one of the first things he would do would try to find some more land to buy. Um, he really felt that, that land, and as do many people with his upbringing, that land was what you invest in. Land was the asset that would last forever that you would pass uh, to your family members upon your your death. Very, very important idea. This is an idea that perhaps doesn't resonate as much with us uh, in modern times as it would have once upon a time. Uh, but certainly that when the Statue of Frauds was being written, uh, the idea that, that this was the asset that really, really mattered would have, would have been something that everyone would have immediately understood at that time period. And so that's why this is being treated differently. Uh, than other types of contracts. This is the asset that is usually the, the most significant asset that a person owns and the most important asset that a person owns. So here I've grouped the two, uh, or the, actually the three provisions uh, that we had in the statute together. A contract for the sale of real estate, a lease for real estate for a term longer than one year, and a promise or agreement to pay a commission for the sale or purchase of an oil or gas mining lease, an oil or gas royalty, minerals, or mineral interest. All of these, even though they're from three separate sections, the statute of frauds relate back to this contracts involving real property. These requirements apply to deeds, mortgages, leases, easements, purchases, and sale agreements, basically any contract having to do with land. Um, and here, but uh, as is often the case when we talk about um, a legal rule, uh, as you probably have noticed over time, many times we'll start by saying, this is what the legal rule is. And then I'll say, and here are the exceptions to this rule. 
well, this is a situation where we're going to talk about some exceptions. To this point, I haven't shared with you any exceptions. To these, I haven't said, well, you know what, this is the usual rule, but there's these three or four carve outs that we have. But this is one that I think it's important to go through. Um, uh, uh, in this example, we're going to talk about four carve outs. Ashley? Um, really just, I'm going to say one, one, one carve out here. Um, we'll talk about another carve out later on, so I'm sorry about this. Okay, so we have an oral contract to sell the land. Now we know that this type of arrangement has to be in writing, uh, but this one they didn't. They shook hands or whatever. B pays a portion of the price, but not the whole price. B moves on to the land in question, and this is the crucial ingredient. B makes improvements onto the land. He makes, puts, puts in a building, he puts in a fence, he puts a driveway in. He does something that permanently changes the land, presumably for the better. I mean, I guess people can disagree about that, but he is investing money in stuff that if he gets thrown off the land, he can't take it with him. You can't take the fence out of the land. The courts would say, you know what, the statute of frauds means you don't have a contract. I mean, that for this type of contract, for a real estate sale, that type of contract, we need to have a writing. So we're not going to enforce your contract, but we are going to apply that quasi-contract theory that we've talked about in the past. This is the idea that it's kind of, sort of, but not quite a contract. That idea, that's what we're going to be looking at. So we're going to kind of be using equitable principles with respect to this. And the idea that is oftentimes used for this is detrimental reliance. So in this situation, B is a person who relied. B trusted A that A was going to honor his oral contract. So that's where the reliance is, the trust. And the trust has to be reasonable under the circumstances. It seems pretty reasonable. B, he pays for it, he moves in, and A allows all this to happen. So the reliance seems reasonable. And it has to be to his detriment. And we can see the detriment happens when B, either by spending money or by using his own sweat equity, makes improvement to land that A says doesn't even belong to B. So we have detrimental reliance under those circumstances. The courts might well enforce this oral agreement as if it were a contract. But the courts have some options. The court might just say, well, B, A, you have to pay B the value of the improvements, for example. or B doesn't have clean hands in some respect, and so and maybe his reliance wasn't reasonable or something along those lines, so we aren't going to enforce the contract completely. I mean, courts have some flexibility about how to approach this, but you can see this could be one way to avoid the unfair implications of the statute of fraud in these situations. Let me present to you an example of, of how a, another type of contract might play out. So in this case, we have um, we'll have Bob. So we'll have Ted and Bob. Ted owns some land. Ted and Bob live in the same community. It's a small community. They've known each other for years and years and years. Um, they trust each other. I mean, they have a lot of history with each other. No reason for either one of them to think that the other is going to do anything unethical. Well, um, Bob hears to the grapevine that Ted is trying to sell a bit of his land. There's a, a, a parcel of land that Ted wants to sell. Ted's a pretty affluent person in the community and so Bob approaches Ted and said, hey Ted, um, I'd like to buy that parcel and I understand you are willing to sell it for $100,000. Ted says, yes, that's my price and Bob says, okay, I'm willing to buy it but you know what, Ted, a little bit of a complication. I um, am the heir to my great Aunt Maybell's um, estate. I'm expecting to get about $100,000 out of it. She's already passed away, unfortunately. It's going to take a little while for the estate to settle, though. I expect to get the um, $100,000 in about six months. Um, but I want to go ahead and complete this transaction now, or at least get started on it, because um, I know that maybe, you know, you'll have another buyer come around. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to lease your land for the next six months 
and I agree to pay, we'll say a thousand dollars a month for the right to lease the land. And then at the six month point, I will buy your land for $100,000. Ted considers this. He goes, well, I know Bob's an, an honorable person. Um, I, I think this is a, a, a good plan. So Bob and Ted shake on it. They're trusting people. A handshake is good for them. They go about their business. Uh, Bob moves, moves on to the land the next day. The land is undeveloped, and so there is no building to live in. But uh, Bob decides he's going to pup a tent put up a tent there and live off the land for a little while. And uh, in all of his spare time, he starts improving the land. He cuts down some trees. He levels some of the land. He gets a, a backhoe to kind of uh, smooth out the dirt. He uh, puts in a driveway. He puts up a fence. He uh, does some landscaping. He digs a well. He does all the things that he needs to to get ready to build his house. And in fact, he actually starts building the house. He gets a foundation poured. He hires an architect. He even gets the framing of the house done. All of this in the first, we'll say, five months of the, uh, the period of time, of this lease period of time. Ted happens to drive right by this parcel of land every day going to and from work. So he's seeing the changes in the land. Bob drops off the thousand dollar check at the beginning of each month. And so Bob and Ted have a brief conversation that time and Bob kind of updates Ted on what's going on. Hey, you know, I put in a septic tank or hey, I planted some new trees or whatever the thing is that he did that particular month. And so Ted is pretty well aware of the efforts that Bob has been making. Bob has paid promptly every single month. He's been the model tenant, to be honest. So now we're in the last month. And also Bob has been telling Ted every, every uh, month, you know, kind of what the status is with the estate. And Bob has told Ted that it looks like the estate is just about ready to be finalized. And he's expecting to get the money uh, certainly within the next very few weeks. Okay. So about this time, so Ted is thinking this is going to work out great. He's going to get the $100,000. But about this time, Ted out of the blue gets a call from a landman. And the landman says, hey, Ted, I was noticing how you do not have that parcel of land on Smith Street under um, any type of um, lease, oil and gas lease. And Ted goes, well, no, I don't. Um, and and uh, the, the old man says, or the landman says, um, well, we, we think that there is a very significant um, oil deposit <coughs> under that land, and we would be willing to pay you um, an initial uh, uh, amount of $100,000 to um, get a lease on your land, and we'd be willing to pay you um, a significant amount of royalty payments. I mean, it's all going to depend on what we, we, we draw the land, but we have every reason to think that you'll be getting tens of thousands of dollars a month, maybe even more than that, every month once, once you sign this, this lease agreement. And Ted is dumbfounded. He had no idea that this was going to happen. And the landman says, yes, we'll be willing to, to sign, the, sign you up for this deal if you're interested in, in about uh, six weeks. Well, Ted's heart breaks at this point. He's like, what? And he's seeing himself, but I won't own the land then. Bob will own the land. Bob will pay me $100,000 and then immediately turn around and get $100,000. Plus, he'll still own the land and he'll get those monthly royalty checks. Ted is so distraught. He can't believe this predicament. So Ted goes to his attorney. He says, hey, you know, is there any way to get out of this contract thing? The attorney says, well, why don't you show me the contract that you and Bob signed, and I'll see if there's any way that we can get out of it. And Ted goes, oh, oh you know, Bob and I didn't sign a contract. We just shook hands over it. I mean, you know, we've known each other forever. Uh, the, but I can tell you what the terms of it are. And the, the, the attorney goes, wait a second, you, you didn't sign a contract? You don't have any written document describing the deal? Oh, no, we just talked about it. The attorney goes, huh? Statute of frauds, right? That's the way out of this mess for you. You don't have any document that's signed, and we can see, going back here, 
that this is, it is a contract for the sale of real estate. Um, and so we need to have this in writing. So that's your, your strategy to get out. So um, Ted uh, feels, feels uh, much relief. So the next day, Bob comes in to see Ted and, goes, and he says to Ted, hey, Ted, great news. I just talked to uh, my, the attorney, the executor of the estate of Granite Maybell, and he told me I should have the check in seven days. Let's go ahead and set up a time where we can transfer uh, ownership of this parcel of land. Um, I can do it any time this month. You tell me when. And Ted goes, oh, you know what, Bob? You have been such an awesome tenant. Thank you so much for paying promptly, for maintaining the property in good condition. I really do appreciate it. Couldn't ask for a better tenant than you. Um, and I, I, I know that the lease that you and I had was going to expire in a few weeks, two or three weeks, maybe four weeks. Um, so at the end of that, I'm going to need you to move out because the lease will be over and I will need possession of the land at that time. Bob looks at Ted like he's crazy. He's like, what? What are you doing? Uh, yeah, we had a lease, but that was just the first part of this deal. Now it's time for me to buy it. Why do you think I was putting up fences and putting in septic tanks and framing houses? I didn't do that to build you a house. I built it to build me a house. And um, so, uh, so the issue is, what is the predicament? You can see in this situation that Ted is using the statute of frauds to commit a fraud on Bob. He's saying there is no agreement to avoid a true agreement that Ted and Bob genuinely entered into. So uh, Bob trusted Ted and Ted is using this statute of frauds offensively to basically defraud Bob. Remember I said at the beginning of this lecture how the statute of frauds can be used to commit a fraud? Well, this is an example of that. I said how, you know, in Great Britain, they no longer have the statute of frauds. Well, one of the reasons is that slippery people who know about the statute of frauds sometimes tricked people into entering into oral agreements. The slippery person then could decide later on whether the agreement was good or bad for him. If it was good, then maybe he'd continue to honor the agreement. But if it ended up no longer being good for that particular sneaky person, then he would change his mind and say, oh, statute of frauds, we don't have a contract after all. Now we can see though in this case that Bob is probably going to be okay because he's made some improvements on the land. There's some other situations that we'll talk about. Um, I maybe won't talk, maybe I don't have them listed here. So let me share you some, share with you some other situations under the quasi-contract theory that might give Bob relief. One could be partial performance of the contract terms. Now, the deal that we have here is actually, you could look at this as one big deal. And so we could say that Bob partially performed by paying the $1,000 a month. Or you could look at it as two separate contracts. If you look at it as two separate contracts, then Bob hasn't performed any of the obligations under the buy for $100,000. So this could be a matter of how you characterize this, two, de two separate deals or one big deal. A third thing that could give Bob some relief is the fact that um, Ted could be put under oath in court. And if he admitted, yes, I agree to these terms, orally agree to these terms of the contract, um, you know, let's assume that Ted was unwilling to perjure himself by lying, um, then the court could say, well, if you orally admit that these are the terms, then we're going to go ahead and honor the contract, even though it wasn't in writing. So there are some ways to get around the statute of fraud requirement for a real estate deal. Again, it's designed to prevent a fraud from happening by following the requirements of statute of fraud. So now we've covered the um, the five uh, categories for statute of frauds that are covered in our textbook, but now we're going to talk about that category that's unique to Texas. I don't know if it's unique. There may be other states that have it, but it's, it's not certainly listed in our textbook. And it's not a very important one, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. And here is the language. 
an agreement, promise, or contract, or warranty of cure relating to medical care results thereof made by a physician or healthcare provider as defined by this category. So the term healthcare provider is defined in this statute, but we're just going to rely on this term physician here. This section does not apply to pharmacists. So imagine that I go to see my doctor and my doctor says, you know, if, if Groover, let's say I have some illness. Uh, I um, have pain in my shoulder. And the doctor says, Groover, if you just go to physical therapy for uh, five sessions, you'll get over that pain. Um, and so I go to the doctor, I go to the physical therapist for five sessions, and you know what? I'm still in pain. Well, if we didn't have a statute of frauds, I had the potential to sue my physician because he gave me a warranty of cure. At least I thought it was a warranty of cure, and it didn't actually work. Now, the reality is it wasn't that the physician gave me bad advice. It's just that everybody's body's different, and sometimes treatments work better on one person than another. And we don't really want our physicians to run around constantly saying, well, you know, I'm not making a promise here, but, you know, this might work for you, it might not. We don't want them to give you a disclaimer every single time they make a suggestion, hey, eat more vegetables, but I'm not promising you that's going to save your life or anything. Exercise more, but that may not work either. Uh, be sure to uh, get a good night's sleep, but that's not going to protect you either. Uh, don't uh, smoke. You know, I mean, we, we, we don't want those, we don't want the physician to be kind of burdened with constantly giving his disclaimer each time. And so what we say is if we're going to hold a, a doctor to a promise of some kind of cure, um, we're going to require that the promise be reduced into writing. As a practical matter, is a doctor going to reduce that type of promise into writing? No. This is a strategy designed to reduce the likelihood that a physician is going to be held responsible when the cure isn't necessarily completely effective. This doesn't apply to malpractice situations, of course. That's a different category. You'll see that the textbook talks about the equal digni dignities rule. That is not the rule in Texas. So I'm not going to spend time talking about this other than to let you know that uh, the, the terms principal and agent are terms that you are responsible for knowing. Uh, of course, the principal is the person who the agent acts for. Um, the agent becomes the living embodiment of the principal. I like to refer to the principal as Al in my story. And I usually will have my story where Al is the principal and Aggie is the agent. So imagine that Al hires Aggie maybe to be a real estate agent. You hear the term agent there? Yeah, you see that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> anyway, um, so Al hires Aggie to run his business, but Al decides, hey, you know what? I'm going to retire to the south of France. I don't want to deal with the nitty-gritty details of business. So Aggie is the one running the business on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Aggie enters into some contracts. She hires some people. She fires some people. She does a lot of different things. Maybe some of them good, maybe some of them not so good. And it ends up that some people sue Al. Al can't say, uh, well, I didn't sign that. No, he can't because Aggie is his agent. He agreed for Aggie to have this role and he becomes responsible even for bad decisions that Aggie has made. Um, so uh, these terms apply in Texas. Obviously we have principal and agents, agent relationships. The equal dignity rule doesn't apply generally, but you do need to know these two terms. So we have now covered the, uh, a, that a, a contract that can't be performed within a year is covered by the statute of frauds. A co-signing contract is covered by a statute of frauds. An executor's promise to pay the estate's debts is covered by the statute of frauds. A contract in consideration of marriage is covered by the statute of frauds. Any contract involving real property is covered by the statute of frauds. And then we talked about the physician warranty of cure is covered by the statute of frauds. The last one, remember I said before, there was one more we hadn't talked about, is not part of the statute of frauds, but it is part of the UCC. Little refresher, the UCC stands for the Uniform Commercial Code. The Uniform Commercial Code is clearly a separate statute from the statute of frauds, but we do lump this together 
with the uh, a statue of frauds um, just because it, it's the part of the UCC that has a writing requirement. There's actually two writing requirements for the UCC. We're just going to focus on one right now. And that is whenever we, we are selling goods that are worth more than $500, that agreement has to be in writing. So this is the only one of our requirements that has a dollar amount associated with it. So if I'm, if I'm going to sell you my car for $1,000, UCC applies, we have to have it in writing. If I'm selling you my television for $499, the UCC doesn't apply. We don't have to have that in writing. So you do need to know this $500 amount. It has to do with the sale of goods. So we're not talking about, we'll talk about exactly what a good is at a, in a later lecture, but we're not talking about real property, for example, and we're not talking about services. We're talking about stuff, things you can touch. So I'll just add UCC here. Okay, so we've talked about the um, eight categories, I guess what we should call eight categories, I guess seven categories. Oops, here we go. Seven categories under the statute of frauds. By the way, you're responsible for knowing all of these, uh, knowing kind of their ins and outs. You're responsible for knowing the exceptions we talked about here and the exception that we talked about here. So when we do need a writing, when the statute of frauds applies, what kind of writing do we need? I mean, do we need a hundred page a uh, contract that's been notarized and stamped and sealed and filed? No. Usually speaking, the writing requirement is quite a bit more minimal. Uh, the textbook will say that we need these four things. We need to identify the parties to the contract. So going back to Bill and Ted's, uh, Bob and Ted's contract, we need to have Bob and we need to have Ted identify in the document. Usually we don't need to have their full legal name. Let's say Bob's full name is Robert Edward Smith and Ted's full name is Edward Robert Smith. We wouldn't actually have to have their names on the contract, but we would have to have a sufficient amount of the name that it was clear in the context who this person is. Then we need to describe the subject matter of the agreement. Uh, describe the parcel. The parcel located at the corner of Smith and Jones Street that is approximately you know, 100 acres or whatever the particulars of that particular part of land is. Um, we'd have to have the material terms, for example, the price, We're going, going back to the leasing situation, the $1,000 a month due on the first day of the month, and, and the purchase price of $100,000. And then we need to have the signature of the party being charged. In other words, in this case, Bob is trying to enforce the contract uh, with respect to Ted. Bob wants it to be a binding contract. Ted's trying to get out of it because Ted's the current owner. So the only signature we need is Ted's because Bob isn't disputing the validity of the contract. Now obviously both can sign, but Bob's signature is irrelevant. And the signature is a pretty mild requirement in and of itself. It could be initials, it could be a wet signature, it could be an electronic signature, it could be type names, it could be a mark. Let's say that uh, Ted has a broken arm or maybe Ted doesn't know how to write. It could be his ex, something along those lines. Here, we're gonna return to the first part of the statute of frauds. Let's just show you where that is here for a second. Here we go. Going back to our statute of frauds, this is this section right here. This the section A. So promise or agreement must be in writing. A promise or agreement described in subsection B, that's where we list the, the eight categories for the statute of frauds, is not enforceable unless the promise or agreement or a memorandum of it is in writing and signed by the person to be charged with the promise or agreement or by someone lawfully authorized to sign for him. This is just a fancy word, phrase for agent, right? Okay. So I'm going to compare the requirements that we saw here up against the Texas statute. So we have to identify the parties. Where do we have that in the Texas statute? 
the agreement is in writing. So we don't have actual language that says the parties have to be identified. Now we need the signature of one of the parties, so there's a little bit of identification there. And we say the, the agreement has to be in writing, so presumably if you're reducing agreement to writing, you're going to identify the parties. We also have the requirement, according to the textbook, the subject matter of the agreement has to be in writing. The Texas language we work on, we would rely upon for that same requirement would be the agreement is in writing. The material terms have to be in writing. That's according to the textbook. We're going to rely upon that same language um, from the statute that we see in Texas, the agreement is in writing. And then again, we the, the, the fourth element here we do have in the statute, signed by the person to be charged with the promise. So you can see the Texas statute is a little bit more vague than um, the text the textbook might have expected it to be but with the case law gloss that we have these same ideas definitely have to be present in a uh, contract to satisfy the statute of frauds even in texas um so let's talk about i kind of already covered these so i'm not going to spend a lot of time on these these are the three equitable remedies that allow one to get out of the writing requirement and I talked about this with respect to the Ted and Bob situation. These are the three scenarios. One is that part performance. Remember I said how if we saw the contract between Bob and Ted as a singular contract, in other words, it was just one contract, the first part was the lease for $1,000 a month, the second part was purchasing for um, $100,000, if we see that as one big agreement, then we would say that Bob engaged in partial performance. Um, and that means that um, uh, Bob or Ted can't get out of it if Bob is partially performed, even if the agreement is just oral. Um, of course, it has to be partial performance by the person who's trying to enforce the oral agreement. So if Ted partially performs, uh, that's not going to help Bob enforce the agreement against Ted. This particular category, partial performance, is recognized in Texas. Then we have the promissory estoppel. This is uh, when, when uh, Bob goes out and puts the fence in, starts building the house, puts in the septic tank. He's relying upon the fact that, Bob, that Ted is going to honor his agreement. And he's relying um, that, that that's going to work out OK. Um, you know, based upon the circumstances. Equable estoppel isn't exactly the circumstances that we had in this case because in the scenario that I presented with Ted and Bob, when Ted and Bob initially entered into the agreement, they both thought that they were just going to follow the agreement. Neither one had any evil intentions at that time. But let's just switch up the facts a bit and let's make Ted much more evil than we initially had him be. And let's assume that when Ted and, and Bob were negotiating, Ted knew about the statute of frauds and knew that the agreement needed to be reduced into writing. Uh, maybe he had actually already been contacted by the landman and he's thinking maybe this will work out but maybe it won't work out because he'd been contacted in the past by landmen and they had made these floated these numbers and they had never panned out. And so he, he wasn't sure whether he wanted to actually sell his land to Bob. I mean, obviously, if the landman actually delivered this money, he didn't want to have a real contract with Bob. But it's also possible the landman would, would change his mind and, and not actually enter in the contract. Under that scenario, he did want a contract with Bob. And so Ted might say, hey, you know what? What I ought to do is enter into an oral contract with Bob. Bob doesn't know about the writing requirement. If it ends up as advantageous to me, I'll just go ahead and act like it's an enforceable deal. But you know what? If it ends up that it's not advantageous for me, I'll just plead statute of frauds. Well, that would be a situation where the defendant led the plaintiff to believe that a writing is not required. He, he knew about the requirement and didn't require and, and uh, led the other person to think that it wasn't necessary. So the courts would apply the doc doctrine of equitable estoppel here. Let's look at the term estoppel for a second. You can see in the middle of the word estoppel, you have the word stop. Of course, we have the word equitable. We know from the equity is a category of law, just, excuse me, category that is separate from the law. And this is where the courts really look at being just, being um, fair. Those are the ideas. So when we see equitable, think 
um, an emphasis upon justice. So the court is going to stop the um, use of the statute of frauds because it interferes with the ideas of justice. It's not right, in fact, it perverts the whole idea of the statute of frauds. The statute of frauds is designed or supposed to prevent fraud, and now somebody is using it to commit a fraud. I wasn't able to find a case where this has actually played out, and the Texas courts have said, yes, this doctrine is something we're willing to apply, but I think it's very, very likely the Texas courts would be willing to uh, apply this. So you can see these three categories are designed to prevent a crafty person from using statute of frauds to trick or take advantage of Bob, the naive person. I don't have on this list the situation where, where Ted is called to testify and he admits to the oral contract, but that is a, a fourth one that you will commonly see on this list as well. So now we have covered our statute of frauds. I hope that this uh, lecture has been helpful for you in mastering these terms. In our next lecture, we'll discuss um, the interpretation rules for contracts generally and also the parole evidence rule. Um, I appreciate your attention. And of course, as always, if you have questions about the material, please feel free to drop me an email message or um, even better, come by my office hours and we can talk at great length sorting through those problems. Again, I thank you for your attention and have a wonderful day.